Hello friends, let's talk about spinal tuberculosis. The most common area where the tuberculosis will occur in a skeletal system is spine. Sir, I will request you to explain uh, this image before we go ahead, sir. Well, this image was taken before the MRIs were available. The image as well as its X-ray. Image was removed or obtained from medical college Patna with the permission of Professor uh, Mukhbadia. I took the specimen to Varanasi from that place. It was in a, a preservative. That bottle was taken from Patna to Varanasi. I got it x-rayed and this is in front of you. It shows beautifully the pathology of spinal tuberculosis. One can see the at the angular deformity, one can see gross destruction of the vertebral body. Probably there are more than two vertebral bodies. You don't see much of the intervening disc even. Even the disc has practically undergone degeneration or absence. And look at the x-ray of the same specimen. This is not an x-ray of the patient. This is an x-ray of the specimen per se. And one can see the destruction of the vertebral bodies. How many bodies? Probably two vertebral bodies. Probably one can judge it from the presence of the pedicle. One pedicle at the top and one pedicle at the bottom. The, the proximal pedicle does not have the bone, does not have the full vertebral body visible to it and the distal pedicle does not have the body visible at all. So in that area, the total bone got destroyed, the intervening disc got degenerated, thinned out and it was not visible. So the x-ray which we are seeing is not an x-ray of the patient, it is an x-ray of this specimen. And one can see the gradual deformation that has taken place of the vertebral column, the cord, the dural tubes have tolerated this angulation. The dural tube tolerates angulation in tuberculosis of the spine for a very long time because under the circumstances the deformity in the vertebral column takes place very very slowly. The dural contents contain the neural elements which have a tremendous amount of plasticity. Some tracts would get totally destroyed but the remaining tracts may take over the function. However, if there is a sudden deformation, the patient will not have an opportunity to get the benefit of neuronal plasticity. But in tuberculosis, fortunately, the things take place slowly, so neuronal plasticity covers many neurological deficiencies for a very long time. Today, we have the facilities. In addition to x-rays, we have the facilities for MRI and CT scan. And they can pick up uh, the pre-destructive stage, yeah. which was uh, actually not the scenario before they came into existence. A statement that you have mentioned here is uh, compromised cell mediated immunity can provoke disseminated tuberculosis. And you've been showing that there are multiple hotspots in the entire body in this. Sure. How often do you get a bone scan for uh, tuberculosis? I don't get it very frequently, but. Mm, why are you seeing this hotspot? I didn't ask for this one. They came with this uh, scan to me. Uh, I think a reference pattern, I would say just. It is a reference pattern and one can see the hot areas. This patient recovered remarkably by anti-TB drugs. 
I could follow him up for about seven or eight years. Sir, what is your usual battery of test that you will perform in a patient whom you have started anti-tubercular therapy? I would start the anti-tubercular drugs only if I am sure of the diagnosis. And once you have started it? No. The first thing is get the x-rays done. Get an x-ray done for the chest. Get the x-ray done for the spine. Get their basic blood test done. Every patient which comes to you and you suspect tuberculosis, we must have a blood sugar done. Blood sugar. If somebody is a diabetic, his immune compromise is there, they are more likely to have tuberculosis infections. Uh, here it of course showing you a classical tuberculous limb in the cervical spine. And the classical one is diminution of the disc space with erosion of the paradiscal margins with or without pre or para vertebral collection of soft tissues. Now you can appreciate the presence of a soft tissue only if you know what are the normal soft tissues. Now look at the cervical spine in A. There is a pre vertebral shadow. There is a small layer of soft tissues and then air. Above the uh, distal to the cricket cartilage, see, that arrow is at distal, arrow is at the cricket cartilage, distal to the cricket cartilage, between the air space and the vertebral bodies, there is esophagus. Proximal to the cricket cartilage, between the vertebral bodies and the airspace, there is only soft tissue, there is no other organ there. So there is a difference between the anterior soft space above the level of the cricket cartilage and distal to the cricket cartilage. Have an idea about the normal width and then you can judge it what is happening in the abnormal situation. For diagnosis of a pre-destructive stage, MRI can show you a great deal, more importantly the edema in the bone which can never be picked up on the x-rays in the initial stage and it is very very good for the junctional areas like the craniovertebral junctions, the cervicothoracic junction, the lumbosacral junction, the sacroiliac area and the entire sacrum. For these areas, MRI can be extremely, extremely important apart from showing you early bone marrow edema that you have clearly mentioned. Tuberculosis of the sacrum, sacroiliac joint, pelvic bones, without involvement of the hip joint, etc. I think MRI would pick it up much earlier than X-rays. Before the availability of MRI, or for that matter, even CT scan, we were seldom able to diagnose a case of uh, sacral tuberculosis till they formed an abscess at the back and ulceration at the in between the gluteal folds. Then only we thought it could be tuberculosis of the sacrum. Again, we judged the tuberculosis of the sacrum by looking at the borders of the ulcers, borders of the um, sinuses. Uh, Plain x-rays would not show early destruction of the sacral joints, nor it will show the early destruction of the sacrum per se. It is only advanced destruction that you could probably see in the x-rays. And MRI probably is an extremely important investigation for difficult areas as mentioned, junctional area, cervicodorsal, craniovertebral, sacral, these are very difficult areas to make a diagnosis only based upon the x-rays. So sir, this is an MRI showing you uh, tuberculosis of the junctional area I just discussed. And remember that TB always will have some sort of soft tissue component along with the fluid, which can help you differentiate it from the other diseases that might affect this area. See, one can see a huge pre-sacral abscess or collection, you can say it. And see, the 
change of the signal. The picture which is to your left hand is T1. The picture to your right hand is T2. And as a teacher, we make mnemonics T2 water white. Therefore, T1 should be water black. So, you can see in T1, the contents of the dural tube, CSF, contents of the pre-vertebral abscess, they are white. But if you look at the T1, all of this has become black. The T1 shadow of the abscess is not absolutely black. It means it is not only water, but also some soft tissues inside, maybe granulation tissue inside, a thick caseous material inside. The fat remains white. You can see fat behind the spinous processes. Fat remains white both in T1 and T2. And the fluid does change, but uh, the blood vessels would change the signal depending upon the speed of blood running into them. Sometimes they can almost cheat you. Signal wide. Signal wise, they can cheat you. So uh, T1 is has got a 1 in it. 1 means the first year subject of anatomy. So T1 is better for the anatomy. T2 has 2 into it. The second professional subject is pathology. And T2 shows you the pathology better. So T1 is water is black and T2 has a 2. So 2 times W water white is T2. So these are the things and, and the other thing that Sir has beautifully mentioned showing you the pre-sacral abscess in an L5-S1 2 vertebral destruction is high likelihood of being tuberculosis. Going to the top, again what Sir just mentioned here, the collection, the destruction, Sir. Uh, as mentioned earlier, these are difficult areas and MRI has helped us tremendously in making these diagnoses. Here is a sacrolic joint showing compare from the other collection. Side. Always compare. So beautifully delineated. But so long as you have the possibility of comparing one joint with the other normal joint, always seek for comparison through any investigation, clinical as well as investigative procedures. The size of the abscess is not an indicator of the intensity of the disease. There are some people who can have a very severe destruction without much collection and there are others vice versa. Uh, it probably just depends how the patient is, how the patient's own tissues are reacting to the tuberculosis infection depending upon many factors probably and one of them may be the immune system and the reparative power the person has. An alternative pathology like every every uh, area of the body must be considered in non-responders. So this is uh, a patient who had a chordoma resembling TB in the case. You should also keep in mind multiple myeloma, the metastasis and the osteoporotic collapse which can mimic. Sure. Any disease can mimic tuberculosis and tuberculosis can mimic any disease. I think this this uh, can this sentence can be repeated ad nauseum and probably every time it is repeated it is correct. There is a collection here. In retrospective one can say, no it is not likely to be tuberculosis. The borders are not sharp. The borders are irregular and it doesn't give you an appearance of lobulation or loculation. However, still such a picture can also be compatible with tuberculosis. But again, repeating the same thing, when in doubt of the tissue, this turned out to be a chordoma. Chordoma, but a similar picture can be found in myeloma, metastasis, collapse. Probably you will see some of these pictures in the course of time.